With a good understanding of programming basics, it is time to turn our attention to an alternative approach to solving problems, recursion. In today's video, we will be looking at two problems that can be solved using recursion, the factorial and Fibonacci functions. Programmers can use recursion when a problem statement is expressed recursively, also known as a recurrence relation. What this means is that the solution to one example of the problem depends on knowing the solutions to smaller versions of the same problem. For example, if we know the solution to the problem for n, then with a simple formula, we can calculate the solution to the problem for n plus 1. Thinking about that in reverse, that means that in order to solve the problem for n, we need to know the solution to n minus 1. This is a kind of divide and conquer approach. To see an example of recursion at work, let's first take a look at the factorial function, which you may remember from high school mathematics. The factorial function, expressed as an exclamation mark immediately following a number, means that we require the product of all numbers up to and including the given number. We initially start with a definition of the factorial of 0 as 1. The product of all numbers to 1 is trivial. The product of all numbers to 2 is also quite simple. When we get to 3, we start to see extra multiplications. 3 times 2 times 1 is 6. The product of all numbers to 4 is 24. And 5 factorial is defined as 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. We can see a distinct pattern being created here and an informal definition of the factorial function would be described using this mathematical equation. For larger numbers, we can say the factorial value of n is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times all the numbers all the way down to times 2 times 1. But let's look at a more mathematically rigorous definition of the factorial function. There are two ways we can define the factorial. The first is an iterative definition. We see here that n factorial equals the product of all values i from 1 to n. This is essentially the same as the informal definition we arrived at earlier. The second definition we can use for the factorial function is a recursive definition. This splits the definition into two possible cases. The first case states simply that when n equals 0, n factorial equals 1. This is often called the base case or the trivial case. In the second case, for all values of n larger than 0, we define the factorial of n as being equal to n times the factorial of n minus 1. This definition uses the observation that in the iterative case we find ourselves with a copy of the solution to factorial of n minus 1 as a part of the solution of factorial of n. Let's start with an implementation of the iterative factorial function in MATLAB. You can see here we have created a function called fact1 We've chosen this because we will be coding three different factorial functions today. Our factorial function consists of one input argument, which is the number n, and one output argument, which is our answer. To simplify things in our implementations, we are going to assume n is only ever positive or zero. In this first example of the factorial function, we use repetitive programming in the form of a for loop to accomplish the task. Notice that our for loop chooses values of i from 1 to n and for each value of i multiplies the answer by i. We can run a few examples from the command window to confirm that the function is operating as expected. In this second example we will convert our first factorial function into a vectorized solution avoiding the need for any for loops. As you can see here, we have kept the same function definition structure, but just changed the name to fact2. This means the structure appears the same from the outside with only a name change. 
Our first statement creates an array of numbers from 1 to n using the colon operator. Then we call the MATLAB function prod, which computes the product of an array of numbers. Notice that we could simplify these statements even further by doing away with the variable i altogether and simply inserting the vector 1 colon n into the prod function directly. Again, we can run a few examples from the command window to confirm correct operation. Both of the examples so far use some form of iteration or repetitive programming. Even the vectorized solution must, at some point, iterate through the values of the array i, even if this process is highly optimized and hidden from the programmer inside the function prod. So now let's take a look at a recursive solution. Before we look at program code, let's consider an example. When calculating a larger factorial problem using recursion, we will need to recurse through many levels. For example, the recursive definition for 15 factorial is 15 times 14 factorial. Because we don't yet know the value of 14 factorial, we will need to go back to our recursive definition. 14 factorial is equal to 14 times 13 factorial. At each new level, we encounter another factorial problem that is smaller than the original problem. 13 factorial is 13 times 12 factorial. In fact, we can continue like this until we reach the case where n equals 0. If you recall, our base case definition states that 0 factorial is equal to 1. So we are now finally able to resolve this calculation. This may seem very similar to the iterative pr approach, but it is in fact implemented in a very different way. So here we have a factorial function implementation using recursion. Again, we have kept the same function definition structure, but just changed the name to fact3, so it can be called from the command window in the same way as the previous two functions. The function tests the input value n to see if it is equal to 0, which means it would fall into the first case. This is the base case or trivial case. If not, then n is assumed to fall into the second case. Notice that in the second case, the calculation of the answer requires the answer to the subproblem of factorial n minus 1. Remember, we are ignoring negative numbers for this example, but a suitable test could easily be incorporated to ensure n is not negative. In fact, the nature of recursion means that somewhere in our function, we must have a call to the same function, but with a different input argument. In our case, we are calling factorial of n minus 1, from within the function factorial of n. This may seem a roundabout way of computing the factorial function, but there are certainly benefits to the recursion approach, as we will see later. To help us understand what is really going on under the surface in this recursion example, we will add two lines to our function. This will help us keep track of when we enter the function and when we exit the function. As you can see, the first line simply reports that we have started the factorial function with a value of n. And the last line reports that we are about to finish the factorial function with a value of n. Now, when we run this program with an example of n equals 4, we get this output. Notice that the first call from the command prompt generates the line that we have started the factorial function with n equals 4. However, it is not until the very end that we see the corresponding finished line for n equals 4. In fact, during the intervening time, we have started and finished every other call of the function for every other value of n. We can see that each successive call to the factorial function reduces n by 1 until we get to the n equals 0 call. Inside the n equals 0 call, the function will, ex will execute the base case, or the trivial case, which allocates the answer of 1 and finishes straight away, meaning that we can now resolve 
all previous calls to the factorial function that have been left hanging whilst waiting for the answer to a smaller version of the same problem. Following the program flow in a recursive environment is not straightforward. So here is the function reproduced for our benefit and we will track the flow through the function for each call. Let's assume the function is initially called from the command window with input n equals 4. The function will start executing from the beginning, print out the starting line and then check the value of n. As n equals 4 it will skip over the if statement and execute the else part. However, because we do not know the value of factorial of n minus 1, the program cannot continue with this call. It must suspend the call of the function for now whilst calling the n equals 3. When this happens, all data relating to the n equals 4 call is stored on the stack for later use. So the function starts again, this time with n equals 3 prints out the starting line and checks the value of n. Again, it skips over the if statement and goes straight to the else part. Because it cannot resolve factorial of n minus 1 again, it will suspend and go to the next call. The process is repeated for n equals 2, stopping when factorial of n minus 1 is required. Then the process is repeated again for n equals 1 until factorial of 0 is required. So now we start our base case. Notice that this time after displaying the start message we check for n equals 0 and lo and behold this is the first time that it is actually true. Therefore we allocate the answer of 1, skip the else part of the function and display the finish line. This ends the n equals 0 call to our function. We can now report back to the n equals 1 instance that we have calculated that the value of factorial 0 equals 1 so it can use this answer. This allows factorial 1 to complete, output the finish line and return its value to factorial 2. Then factorial 2 completes outputting the finish line and returns to factorial 3. Factorial 3 completes, outputs and returns to factorial 4 and finally factorial 4 completes, displays the finish line and returns the answer and control back to the command window. At this point you may be wondering why we would use recursion at all. In the factorial example we just followed, the recursion solution seems much more complicated than what it's actually worth. However, recursion can come in very handy when solving problems that are naturally defined as a recurrence relation. Take for example the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of numbers that are defined as a recurrence relation. That is, later values in the sequence depend on previous Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers are defined as follows. The first two Fibonacci numbers, F0 and F1, are assigned the value of 1. These two numbers form our base or trivial cases. Then all subsequent numbers are defined as the sum of the preceding two numbers. That is, f of n is equal to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Here we see a recursive implementation of the Fibonacci function. The function declaration is similar to the factorial one because we have one input, n, and one output called answer, though the name of the function in this case is fib. To ensure our recursion will stop at some point, we need to include our base cases. This means that when fib is called with n equals 0 or n equals 1, it will immediately return the answer of 1. Now, the recursive part of our definition requires that the answer be the sum of the preceding two Fibonacci numbers. When we write our recursive function, we can automatically assume that solutions to any subproblems will be automatically handled by the recursive calls. In some ways, recursion is an approach that produces smaller, easier to read code, even if the underlying program flow is much more complicated. However, there may also be performance impacts when using recursion.
given that multiple instances of subproblems may be called. Programmers need to consider the positive and negative aspects when deciding whether recursion is the right approach to solve the problem.